Good morning, church. How are you all doing today? Are you ready to receive God's word? Let's go to the Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your presence. You are here. So now we ask that the word that has been revealed will become alive, talk to our needs, transform our hearts and our actions through the power of your word. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let me start with a possible scenario. Have you been in a situation where you have been waiting to be seen at a doctor's office and someone that arrives after you gets called in before you? What is your reaction? The possible are some responses here. You feel really excited. You feel like, oh my goodness, this is the time for me to patiently wait and read some more. <laughs> Second, you are really angry that someone else who hasn't been waiting as long as you have got called in first to be seen before you. The third one, this is pretty much me, I go and talk to the receptionist and I ask her, why? Have you been there? Have you been there? Okay. The point is that we don't like to wait anywhere. I mean, you could be at a gas station, the grocery store, the ladies at the mall. We don't like to wait. These are just common day-to-day -day situations that really test our patience. But what about some more serious cases that happen where it seems like everyone else is getting exactly what you're asking for before you. And then you feel disappointed. For example, you have been working at a company for quite a while and someone that has less experience gets the promotion that you always wanted. It seems like everyone else is doing better than you. Your family is not doing as best as the other families. Those kiddos are behaving more than yours. You start comparing with everyone else around you. And you feel that life is not fair to you. Have you been in that situation that you feel like life is just not fair to me? And you arrive to that conclusion. Have you been there? Can you be honest today? Okay, that's probably the other service. As we conclude the sermon series today, uh, entitled The Gospel According to Jesus, we'll be covering our last message with the title, The Last Will Be First, and for this purpose, we'll be reading a very interesting parable from the mouth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. Yes, I'm going to read it all. It's a long passage. You follow along. This is what the word of God says. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and send them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the first one, with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who were here first, who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. This 
who were hired last were only one hour, they say. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. So the context of this parable is connected to the story of the rich young ruler. Do you remember last week? A young man comes to Jesus and asks him, Master, Rabbi, what did, must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him, well, you have to follow all the commandments. And the rich young ruler says, well, I have kept them all. I mean, I'm, I'm good at it. I'm an expert at it. I've been obedient. I, I've been a good neighbor. He started to list all the good things. However, he was lacking something. And then Jesus tells him, well, you know what? You have to do something else. Go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. And then he said, well, I don't like that. <laughs> he left. And then Jesus was lovingly trying to show this man that he had not kept God's law perfectly. He had broken the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. The young man loved his possessions and wealth more than he loved God, which is idolatry. So the disciples started to look at each other and say, so, so if this man that has followed the law, that is wealthy, that has everything, I mean, he's, he's just not going to heaven. So how can we go to heaven? And then Peter voices a concern. You know, Peter exemplifies you and I. You know, Peter says, oh, Jesus, we have left everything for you. Everything. Everything? Just fishing. But yeah, everything. Everything, Lord. So when we are in your kingdom, what is it that we're going to get as a reward? I mean, what is it for, for us, Jesus? Do you remember that his mom also asked for the same thing? And, and he wanted to know what was going to happen in the future. And Jesus said, well, don't worry. You're going to have a position. You're going to be reigning. In fact, not only you, but everyone in the kingdom will be honored. Everyone who has left houses and brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. So then Jesus illustrates this point with the parable that we just read by starting by saying, for the kingdom of heaven... It's like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Jesus opens this story with a man who is a master of a house and owns a great vineyard. And it was time to harvest all his grapes. Owning a vineyard is a risky enterprise even today. But imagine, especially in ancient world, there weren't a lot of, you know, climate control, barrel rooms, and it was imperative that you harvest all the grapes at their peak of their ripening, because even one day will make a difference in the quality of the wine. So this master goes out early, and that has to be right before 6 a.m., so about 5.30. All of those of you who get up really early, may God bless you. That's what's happening here. 5.30 in the morning, he goes out and he goes and finds workers. The work day starts at 6 a.m. in this story and ends at 6 p.m. So he goes and he finds some workers early in the morning, no doubt. And he asks them, would you work for me? And they say, yes, okay, let's break a deal here. I'm going to pay you a denarius. And, okay, church, a denarius was like a good pay. Like Roman soldiers 
were getting paid one denarius per day. So unskilled workers like this in the marketplace, they will probably get half or even a fraction of a denarius. So they say, yes, of course, we are ready. That's a good deal. So he does the same thing and he goes and then he comes back around nine and he sees some other workers. You work for me today and I will pay you like one of my normal employees. And then he says, I'm gonna pay you what is right. And then he comes back around noon and he does the same. He goes back and he tells them, you know what? I'm gonna pay you whatever is right. And they go and they work. And then he comes back at like around 3 p.m. And then he sees some other standing in there and they're just waiting to be seen. They're waiting for an opportunity. Listen, sometimes we are like that. Sometimes we are waiting for the opportunity and it, it seems like it never arrives, right? It's like we're waiting and 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 nothing happens, but Jesus shows up. That's what happens here. So 3 p.m. Now, 5 p.m. And then he asked them, why have you been standing here idle all day? And the master says to them, you know what? There's still one hour in the day. Go and work too and I will pay you. Finally, it was the end of the day and it was time to pay everyone. The master tells us here in the story that the foreman goes and, and gathers everyone up that work the day to give them their wages, starting with those that started at five in the afternoon, all the way up to those that started first thing in the morning. Those that started working first thing in the morning, so everyone ahead of them getting paid a full denarius for a partial day of work. Oh, there was probably no doubt that they were thinking to themselves, we won the lottery today. If they got paid one denarius for just one hour, three hours, five hours, we have, we have it made. You know what? We have it made. Maybe, maybe this master is gonna pay us like eight denarius or 10 denarius. We're not gonna have to be working for the whole like half a month. But no, uh, uh, that didn't happen. No, they go and the master gives them one denarius. Come on, get in the story. You and I are the workers. How would you feel? I would scream and say, that's unfair. I've been working all day long. I've been working through the sun in the heat of the day, especially in Texas. Imagine 100 degrees, 12 hours, and you are making me equal than the last guy that was hired just an hour? No, there is no way. And we feel the entitlement to say, that's not fair. And let me tell you something, if you don't remember anything about this Columbia preaching today, grace is not fair. It is not fair. The master says, friend, by the way, in Matthew, every time you see the word friend is used ironically. The three instances, friend, didn't you agree to work for me for just a denarius, friend. And they say, yes. And then in the original says, or is your eye evil? Is your eye bad? What is the problem? Is it the problem of the denarius or that I was generous to the other guys because I was generous to you in the first place? So Jesus concludes his parable by telling his disciples a proverb. He says in Matthew 20, 16. So the last will be first and the first last. In our passage, Jesus is making a simple statement. He's saying to those that are first are last and those that are last are first. And how is this possible? Imagine a foot race. How many runners do we have here in the house? That's what we're feeling bad. Yeah. The only way for the first to be last and the last to be first is if everyone finished the race at the same time, if every single runner crossed to the finish line simultaneously, then 
the one who finished first also finished last and vice versa. Everyone finishes at the same time. And this is precisely the point that was the point of Jesus in this story. You know, let me tell you something. Grace is not fair. If God would give us what we deserve, we would be dead. Because the, the wages of sin is what? Death. You guys know the verse. Here's where we finally see the main point of the parable. God gives us the same eternal life to all that follow Jesus Christ. No matter if you have followed Christ faithfully for 80 years or you triple or stumble for one week, God saves us by His grace. It is only and purely a gift of grace. Can I get an amen? Thank you, brother. So this is a recap here. The kingdom of God is God's rule, is God's reign through Jesus Christ in the hearts of His children. The master is God our Father. The vineyard is God's kingdom where he reigns. The laborers or workers are the Christians, you and I, the citizens of the kingdom. The day of work is their lifetime. Evening is eternity where all people will stand before Christ to give an account for their life, whether they worship him or not. The denarius represents eternal life. No matter how hard anyone labors or how much we do for the Lord, we are given eternal life by God's grace alone. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no hierarchy. There is no the ones that have or the have nots. Christians are all the same. There is not a group of disappointed, misfit Christians or believers. Because the basis of every single believer's salvation is Christ. It is grace. So for those of you, because this is a narrative, so it's an inductive message, right? We're working through the story. But here are the three points. God's gift of salvation is unconditional. God's gift of salvation is unconditional. Verse 9 says, The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. It is not based on principles of merit that God gives us grace. God's unconditional love is there for us. He loves us before we were born. He has loved us with an everlasting, unbreakable, never giving up type of love. Parable like this one challenges us when we operate in our relationship to God on a principle of merit. Saying, well, Lord, if I do this, you will love me more. The answer is no. N-O, no. God loves us regardless of what you do, where you come from, the position that you have, the possessions that you have. He loves us because he loves us unconditionally. Aren't you happy because of that? That's the difference in the gospel. You know, God will only love you on the merit of Jesus Christ. He sees our lives through the life of his son, Jesus the workers that joined the work in the last hour were all given a denarius, no matter how much they work. And remember, this was an incredible generous wage for a day worker. The Apostle Paul encapsulates this principle when he writes to the church in Ephesus. And he says in Ephesians 3, 17 to 21, these verses were read to the deacons on Monday. I joined the meeting online, brother. So that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Verse 20, it gets better. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, 
To him be the glory in the church and in Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. And the church says, wow. I could just wrap up the sermon here. This is incredible. All the workers that were paid that they receive a denarius, an unconditional gift from God. Church, there is power in the name of Jesus. Do you believe that? There is power in the name of Jesus. He can do more than all we can ask or imagine at Port Cities Baptist Church. We believe that we had great years behind us, but we are also confident that the greater years are ahead of us. We believe that the power of Jesus is still restoring individuals, families, and communities. We believe that the power of Christ is here to renew our strength, to heal our hearts, and to humbly use our lives for His glory. It is His work in our lives. It is Christ working in His power through the Holy Spirit, through us. Church, our city is Baptist Church. God is as work through His Son, Jesus, here. Do you believe it today? Just show it a little bit. Titus 3, verses 5 to 7, look what it says. He saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that, coma, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Here Paul teaches us the same message from Jesus' parable. It's not about how hard or how long you labor for the Lord that saves you. It is not about your works, but about His mercy, His generosity, and His grace. It is Christ and justification through faith in his sinless life, death on a cross, and resurrection from the dead that gives us eternal life. The reason Christ saved us is so that he could show his love for us and free us from our sins so that we could live a life that glorifies him. We are conduits of his glory. You and I are shining God's glory. Wow. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, For it is by grace that you have been saved. You know this, church. If you grew up in church like me, you memorized this in Sunday school. Through faith, and it is not from yourselves. It is what? The gift of God. Not by works so that no one no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It is by grace. But we also see another principle that Jesus is teaching us here in this parable. God's generosity is overwhelming. God's generosity is overwhelming. But those workers hired early in the morning got really upset at the master's generosity. They said, that is not fair. You owe us more for our work. Aren't you forgetting something? <laughs> they felt entitled. Just like we believers can presume that God owes us more for our faithfulness. You can be asking God, well, Lord, I, I have been faithful to you all my life. I deserve X. I deserve a church in Cancun. <laughs> right? I've been faithful to you. My great-grandmother was the first missionary in a little town. Then my grandfather. Then, you know, we suffer for the gospel in Colombia. Come on, Lord. Give me a church in Cancun. That doesn't work. It just doesn't. Because grace is not fair. God loves us with unconditional, unbreakable type of love, regardless of our sins. Now, church, now, 
It is not by works, but if you are truly saved, you will bear fruit, okay? You will bear fruit, of course. If you are faithful, if you follow God's principles and commandments, you will bear fruit and you will be known by your fruit, okay? Now you're saying, this Colombian guy is preaching the wrong gospel. No, that's grace. But when you really adopt God's faithfulness through His grace and the redemptive power of Jesus working in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are empowered to accomplish His purposes. That's what the Bible tells us. The gospel is freeing, is liberating, is overwhelming in grace in ways that we cannot fully comprehend. We are absolute fools to appeal to God for justice instead of celebrating His grace. He has more. She has more. They've been blessed more than I am. And we start, you know, the more that we are in, the, in this Christian life, I, I, I grew up in church in, in the pews. I, I went to, I don't know how many services growing up. I had to go like, I don't know, three services on Sunday, then, then the Wednesday night, then the youth on Saturday. I, I, I done this thing. Honestly, I heard this thing many times until the point that God brought conviction into my life that I needed to have a relationship with him that I was lost, even because I thought that I had everything, because I knew everything, because I knew all the verses, because I won the prize. When I memorized all the verses, I won the prize twice. Now I have to do it in English. But you know what, that's pointless. We miss the mark. We malign the gospel when we add to grace. Because we think by what we do, so we don't think that we are the last our workers. We think we are the first our workers. Oh, I've been working for you, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Glory to your name. Amen. You and I are the last our workers. You probably have heard the saying that says, you know, just as if I've never seen justification, but we Christians, we have to believe just as if I always obeyed. Because I cannot obey by myself. I cannot do that. Consider a man like the Apostle Paul or Peter, perhaps, who served the Lord faithfully for years and ushered many into the kingdom of God. He's like the worker hired early in the morning. Then you have the thief on the cross, who the only thing that he did was begging Christ to be saved. And Jesus turns to him and tells him, I tell you that you will be with me today in paradise. God keeps his promises. And this leads us to the last point. God's grace is sufficient. So the last will be first and the first will be last. This phrase encapsulates a lot of the sermon today. God doesn't give us what we deserve, which would be his justice. God gives us what we do not deserve, which is his grace. Hashtag Rolando Aguirre, okay? Do it again. God doesn't give us what we deserve, but because that would be his justice. God gives us what we do not deserve, which is his grace. The Apostle Paul knew it. He learned this. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power might rest on me. Church, what do we do today? Hands on. Stop living by words on a merit system. Sometimes we just don't get it, even though we think we get it. Embrace God's grace. He has loved us with an everlasting, never giving up type of love. Live by God's grace. We are vessels of His grace. And not only that, but share that grace with others. Share that grace with others today.
Would you do that? You and I are the first hour workers most of the time thinking that we earn it or we deserve it. But you know what? Christ is the first hour worker. He worked for us, he paid it all, and he orchestrated it all. You and I get to be with him only and purely by his grace. Let us pray. Lord, there is nothing that we can add to the gospel. Nothing. You love us before we were born. You have a purpose for our lives before we were born. Lord, we repent of our sinful nature sometimes. The sense of entitlement, thinking that we can do it all. Or that we can add to grace. And we forget to rest on you, on the absolute power of the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross that paid it all. So today, we realize once again that it is not by what we do, by what we bring to the table, it is through Jesus and only through Jesus. Lord, we plead, we help, we need help today. We plead for help today. We need so much from you today. Allow us to experience your power in the name that is above all names, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.